pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Mark Ryzen from University of Texas at Austin. Mark uh, is a professor of physics and professor of pediatrics at UT Austin. Can you imagine? And he also holds hold the Sid Richardson Foundation region uh, chair there. And Mark got his undergraduate degree in mathematics. Then he did his graduate research in critical physics. Then he switched to experiments. So he is a true universalist tried it all and he works at the intersection of everything. His research spans a vast range of topics from fundamental ideas how to control the motion of atoms and molecules as you will see here to applications to uh, isotope separation uh, with uh, of course numerous applications in cancer therapy, medical human basic research and as many of you know he also has started a non-profit foundation. The point for Foundation with the goal of advancing the production and use of the uh, isotopes for uh, medical research, for basic research, and for, for benefit of humanity. So, list of his awards uh, takes the whole page. So, I won't take any more of his time, and let's just welcome our speaker. Thank you very much, and it's a pleasure to be here. Can you hear me in the back? Good. So uh, I thought today I would tell you about something different than I think the last few times that I've been here. You may not remember those talks either, but this is a different one. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about um, Brownian motion, which you probably have heard of, but I'll also be talking about Einstein's speed demon, which you may not have heard of because I made it up. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, not not quite, but uh, but that term at least. And I'll give you a hint, it has nothing to do with relativity. Okay, okay so let me, uh, as I like to do, I, I very much uh, like history, and this is my hero, uh, also Einstein's hero, by the way, James Clerk Maxwell, uh, and uh, needs no introduction to this audience in particular, but I want to focus today on one aspect of his theory and his predictions, and that has to do with radiation pressure. The fact that electromagnetic waves can exert a pressure, you know, here, now you, you don't see my hand bouncing back, obviously it's a small effect, but it actually has remarkable consequences. Um, until Maxwell's work, uh, there was evidence of radiation pressure, but it was not quantitative. Uh, Maxwell's equations actually predicted uh, radiation pressure and then as usual, uh, experimentalists tried to observe the effect. And the first one that rose to that challenge is this person, Sir William Crookes, a very distinguished scientist, as you can tell from his mustache. Right. Uh, he in did many things. He invented the vacuum tube. And one of his inventions uh, is, the, no, is known as the Crookes radiometer. This is not the original one, but you can buy it at, at any, uh, many, many scientific stores for under ten dollars, and uh, how many people here have played with a Crookes radiometer? Oh, fair amount. So uh, it, essentially, it's a vacuum bulb, like a like a light bulb, and inside you have a vein um, that w with with uh, several leaves that are free to rotate. And if you notice, I don't know if you can see in this light, but one side of each leaf is painted silver, and the other is black. Now, from the standpoint of radiation pressure, just from momentum conservation, when on the silver side, the light hits it and is reflected back, whereas on the black side, the light is just absorbed. So for momentum conservation, you should have twice the radiation pressure on the silver side as the light side, and as, as the dark side, rather. And uh, so Crook built this. He uh, illuminated it with a light source, and lo and behold, the thing spun. And he was very excited about this and submitted it for publication. I don't know where, PRL, probably not. But, but apparently Maxwell got wind of it and was also very excited because this verified his prediction for radiation pressure. But there was a slight problem. It spun in the wrong direction. Now, this is not a minor problem. This is not like, you know, you, you can write an erratum to your paper because it is totally wrong. In fact, it was so discouraging to, to uh, Sir William that that pretty much ended his scientific career, and he spent the rest of his life 
uh, photographing ghosts, which he called, or he thought they were ghosts, spirit photography. This is one example of his, of his photograph. Uh, and so it was not, not such a good ending to his life. But um, it took many years, actually, to understand what was happening. And the explanation was that uh, this was not radiation pressure at all. And in fact, if you have a Crookes radiometer, it does not demonstrate radiation pressure. Instead, the problem was that there was enough residual gas in, the, in, in this cell that <clears throat> the, 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 the dark side was absorbing the light and getting a little warmer than the bright side. And that led to collisions with the background gas molecules, and they came off a little faster off the dark side, giving it a momentum kick. And that was the effect. So that's why it spun in the wrong direction. So despite the claim, initial thought, uh, this was not the effect. And the problem was that the vacuum pressure was not low enough. And the, I guess the, the friction was too high in these veins. So it took uh, at least another almost 20, 28 years to observe radiation pressure. And it was done independently in two experiments, one by Lebedev in in Russia in 1901, and the other by Nichols and Hull in the US around the same time. Uh, and they conclusively observed radiation pressure. Now, you can say, so what? You know, it's a very, very delicate effect. Could this have any consequences? And, and at this time, certainly one would say no. And, and that was for several reasons. One, they were trying to move large objects and secondly, they only had weak light sources. And nowadays, we have lasers, and we can operate, act on very small particles. And let me jump from that, 1901 to 2016, an actual proposal which is funded, I think, by private money at this stage. And I'll, I'll let you decide if this makes any sense to do this. And I won't tell you my opinion. But uh, they want to take little, uh, what they call light sails, or star chips, and uh, launch them near the speed of light using this radiation pressure, uh, all the way to Alpha Centauri, uh, where they will take snapshots and send them back to us. Right? And, um, and that should cost around $10 billion if it works. OK, that's interesting. So uh, from 1901, this is an example of one thing that one could think of doing with radiation pressure. Now, what, what changed the field in radiation pressure, and I have to say that really almost nothing happened from 1901 until this, until this man, Arthur Ashkin, who was at Bell Labs at the time. I, I talked about him yesterday in my seminar. And Ashkin, who just now, last, last year, was recognized by the Nobel Prize in Physics, uh, pioneered what is now known as the optical tweezer. Sorry. <coughs> the optical tweezer is a focused beam of light. And what Ashkin recognized is that by using a laser and by using very small particles, you could actually make the radiation pressure a, a, a very strong force compared to, say, gravity or even, even the energy scale of, of KT, of colliding with background molecules. Uh, this is a picture of a microscope objective. And if you see this little dot here, which I can replace with my laser pointer, same color, practically, uh, that it is, uh, it is just suspended there in, it's probably in water. And you can see it glowing. And nowadays, there are many, many labs around the world that have this. Uh, without going into too, too much detail, you can understand how an optical tweezer works simply by, uh, by invoking momentum conservation and index of refraction. So imagine that we have a laser beam coming in. And imagine that this is a solid sphere of glass. Clearly, uh, the, the beam will refract, causing it to change direction. Assuming it's not absorbed, that does change the momentum of the light, because light carries momentum, as we know, and, and it's changing direction. So there has to be a corresponding, um, th this is the change, this uh, uh, yellow arrow is the change in the momentum of the light field. We call it photons, but you don't have to invoke uh, the quantum picture, you can do this as a classical field as well. And there has to be then a corresponding momentum acting on the bead for momentum conservation. Now, what I'm saying is that with laser powers that are small, even, even like this laser pointer, this can be enough to move a very small bead of the scale of a few micrometers. 
one can also see that uh, th that if you have a, a focused laser beam, you actually get restoring forces in three dimensions. The same uh, discussion about, and I won't again, we'll prove this to you, but you can you can uh, convince yourself or read about it, is that if you have this little particle, it will uh, find itself in the focus. If it ever moves out of the focus, it will it will be pulled back in in in, in three dimensions, and so. In, in the presence especially of some dissipative environment like water or air that will damp out its motion and it will sit quietly at that point in the center. Now the typical uh, configuration that is used, and I have to say that after Ashton's work in the 70s, most, almost all of optical tweezer work moved towards biology and biophysics. It actually, in a way, um, did not there did there was not a lot of work in basic physics except that except for trapping of atoms but if we think about the trapping of particles it really went in more into biology and typically they use a microscope objective and with a single beam you can trap with a short working distance you can trap a dielectric particle um, this uh, this configuration is very stable and it, and, it, and it works reliably and many groups around the world have such tweezers. Uh, you can read, uh, if you're interested, you can read tutorials about this. For example, the Block Lab at Stanford, Stephen Block, um, has a very nice tutorial about optical tweezers and David Greer at NYU, likewise. Uh, Greer has done more fancier things with holographic tweezers where he can make uh, a whole bunch of beams move around and, and move little particles around at will. But today, I want to uh, talk about a physics problem. And I want to revisit an old physics problem, or science problem, because it's really more than just physics. Uh, it could be argued it's more maybe chemistry. I don't, I don't know where to put it exactly, but it's certainly a, a physical type problem. And that is the longstanding problem of Brownian motion, first observed by the botanist Robert Brown in the early part of the 19th century. And it was explained by Einstein's theory uh, in 1905, the theory that predicted diffusion. Now, in diffusion, if you were to monitor the, the growth of, of uh, or the expectation value of the, of, of the displacement squared, uh, it grows linearly with time. So displacement grows like square root of time with some diffusion constant. Now that 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 was borne out by experiment and and you know is sort of the foundations of, of of science today, but there's a problem with that, and it, the way to see this problem is to ask this question: What is the kinetic energy of a Brownian particle? Well, to get kinetic energy, we know the particle has a mass, so if I want to construct one half m v squared, I better know v. Well, what's v? Well, v is the derivative of position. Well, if the position scales like square root of time, the derivative of that is goes like 1 over square root of time, right? Well, that diverges as t goes to 0. Does that mean a, a particle has infinite velocity? That would be strange. So, so clearly, this, this, uh, this model has a problem at short times. And I can illustrate it pictorially by zooming in. If we could zoom in in time, in space and in time, on a Brownian motion, you, you would find that it's self-similar. At every scale that you look at, it, it, it has this randomness in it. And now that I've made you dizzy, I can move on. So, uh, but, but what Einstein realized is that, and he, and he corrected his mistake in a paper in 1907, is that a particle has inertia. And, and, and because there's inertia, there must be a cutoff uh, at short enough times where the motion can no longer be random. And, and so there, this time, this, and I'll talk about this time scale in a moment, um, uh, on those time scales, the motion should be ballistic. Well, now you might think, OK, that, that would be true. Suppose we could look on a time scale between collisions. Well, that's certainly true. But that would be, let's say, immeasurably small. I mean, it, it, that would be, uh, you know, even, even in air, it might be picoseconds. So, Let's not, we're not talking about that. Even in the presence of collisions, a particle 
does not, a particle that's three microns diameter, microsphere, does not change its trajectory from one collision with a background air molecule. So it takes many, many, maybe 10 to the 12 such collisions to actually alter its trajectory because it has this inertia. And so what was predicted is something very simple, is that the, that the, the, uh, ex, the expectation of x squared should be proportional to t squared, which means that, that, uh, that you have ballistic motion, just um, you know, uh, x grows like, temp like time, not, not like square root of time. As long as you're looking at a time scale short compared to this time scale, which is called the momentum relaxation time. Now, the momentum relaxation time generally is proportional to the mass of the particle and inversely proportional to the viscosity. So in a air which has low viscosity, that implies a longer momentum relaxation time, say, than water. Uh, the larger mass, mean, larger inertia, inertia, also means longer relaxation time. So Einstein corrected this mistake in this paper in 1907, and, and, and since then there was a lot of, of subsequent work, for example, Uhlenbeck and Ornstein, 1930. So this was a, then at least conceptually resolved this problem, uh, and, and Einstein called this effect the instantaneous velocity of Brownian motion which says that it's defined as delta x over delta t, just like you learn in your freshman mechanics course. Uh, but you have to measure delta t on this short time scale, much shorter than the momentum relaxation time. And to put some numbers on this, uh, in, if you had a, uh, a three micrometer diameter silica microsphere at room temperature, the RMS velocity, which is independent of anything, is, uh, it only depends on temperature and mass, is 0.4 millimeters per second. But the momentum relaxation time, of course, is very different. And that implies that you have to have, in order to observe this effect, you have to build a, a microscope in space and in time that can resolve uh, uh, with a temporal resolution and a spatial resolution, which in water and air are different. In, in air, a uh, temporal resolution of 5 microseconds and a spatial resolution of about 0.2 nanometers. In water, you need 100 nanoseconds and four picometers, so much smaller than, than the size. So, so we're looking at the center of mass motion of a microsphere that's microns in size, but we have to resolve its center of mass to picometers. But if you could do that, the, the prediction is extremely simple, and this will be the only equation in my whole talk, and you should already know it, and that is known as the energy equipartition theorem of statistical mechanics. It says that the average kinetic energy, one-half mv squared, of a particle in one dimension is equal to one half kt. Kb, t, kb is Boltzmann's constant. So um, this this is a very simple prediction, but had not been observed for Brownian motion. In fact, to make matters even a little more interesting, Einstein made a prediction in, 19, in his 1907 paper, which is always dangerous for a theorist. But he predicted that the experiment is impossible. He said, we must conclude that the velocity and direction of motion of a particle will already very greatly all be already very greatly altered in an extraordinarily short time theta, and indeed in a total irregular manner. It is therefore impossible, at least for ultra-microscopic particles, to ascertain the velocity by observation. So, you know, for, for a theorist to say that is like waving a red flag in front of an experimentalist. Like, yeah. But... but um, but this prediction by Einstein held true for 100 years. Okay. Uh, we revisited it with the optical tweezer. And uh, we constructed a, a little different setup than what is typically used in biophysics. And that is, uh, we, we, instead of using a single beam, we, first of all, we wanted to go to air. Because we said air is going to be a lot simpler than water. The momentum relaxation time is longer. So uh, we said, let's build a, an experiment in air. But one problem you have in air is that because the index of refraction mismatch is much bigger between uh, glass to air than, say, glass to water, there's a much bigger reflection called re Fresnel reflection from, from, the, from the glass microsphere in air, and it tends to push the bead out of the laser beam. That's called the, that's simply the uh, uh, radiation force, and, and it, it just is straight radiation pressure. The other force, which is also a form of radiation pressure, is the gradient force, and that pulls the bead to this focus. 
But in order to comp to really uh, cancel out this this uh, this um, scattering force, we actually need to balance two counterpropagating beams, and we have to align them very precisely. It's kind of like aligning two pins on their heads. So you have to have some procedures for doing this, but we have done this now. We have a procedure that aligns this repeatedly and runs trouble-free. And then we we trap the speed and we can detect it. We can use a beam in the green, or we've also used the same infrared laser. Now, I, what I show here is, is a quadrant detector, and I'm just showing this for reference. This is something you can buy off the shelf. And some of you in the audience may already use these quadrant detectors. They are basically photo detectors that are split. So they, they give you a photo current that for each quadrant, and then by taking the sums and the differences, you can actually uh, determine where the laser beam hits the quadrant detector. So if it's on one half versus the other, you will get a positive voltage. And if it's on the other side, you get a negative voltage. And likewise, so, so uh, this is the standard for position-sensitive detectors. However, the problem was that, that these detectors are rather slow. And so uh, having to do with the fact that they have large surface area, hence large capacitance. So the, the ones that you buy were too slow for our purposes, that we could not resolve this instantaneous velocity. So we, we built our own. And it was a simple idea that we I had an undergraduate build, build it, and it over a summer, and it worked. And it actually gave us immediately a speed up of about a factor of 1,000 compared to anything that is commercially available. So instead of looking at, at uh, we, we could go down in principle to nanosecond time scales. Uh, so by using, by, by, by splitting the fu functions of, of wavefront splitting and photo detection, because we could split the wavefront very nicely and then use fast photo detectors, which could be, in principle, gigahertz fast. So suddenly we could measure the pointing of a laser beam. And this might have other uses. Let's say if you want to monitor how a laser points in, in space, uh, we had a particular application. There may be others where this could be interesting. So now we have a, a very fast po uh, pointing detector. And we could, of course, just look at the scattered light in a camera. And we could measure the mean squared displacement of, of this microsphere. So let me point out, this is on a log-log plot, which makes everything look nicer. But, um, but it looks nice even on a linear plot. Uh, one thing you can see, you might wonder, is why um, in the long time scale, uh, the mean square doesn't change in time. Why is that? Well, it's because we're trapped. So the particle is not free to diffuse randomly at long times. That's what we're seeing here. So that's not so interesting. But what we see is that uh, this, uh, we take the, the black and the red, I'm sorry, the, the green and the, and the red are um, at different pressures. So this is near atmospheric pressure, and this is lower uh, pressure. 100,000 pascals is roughly is atmospheric pressure. And this is our noise floor. <coughs> and what we see is that um, on short enough time scales, the slope is twice of this. And this, this, is, the, this is the diffusion model. And uh, there, there's not a real clear region where diffusion even holds because of the trapping. So because we weren't, we weren't really interested in studying diffusion. Many experiments in the past studied diffusion. So that's, that was not our purpose. But what we see is clearly this depends, uh, this has the, the right slope for ballistic motion, and it doesn't depend on the vacuum pressure. Now, the vacuum pressure changes the viscosity, so it will affect the momentum relaxation time. But at least on, on, on these time scales, you can see, in fact, you can see that, that, the, that the, uh, these two cases, uh, uh, the when the pressure is lower, it, it, it uh, persists longer. But this, is, uh, this was the first observation. You can see it on a linear scale. So the mean squared displacement uh, should scale like time squared. So this is a parabola. And now I think you can clearly see that on time scales less than maybe 15 microseconds, uh, we are clearly in this ballistic regime. And for, for these parameters, the momentum relaxation time is about 48 microseconds. And what we observe are time series, like, like the ones here, uh, again, for the two pressures. Uh, we just record on our fast detector these time series as the bead is moving. And this is on, notice the scale here is, here is uh, uh, 40 nanometers. So that's the scale on which it's moving. And then we can calculate from that uh, the velocity in millimeters per second. <clears throat> and again, 
we get this data with a binning time of five microseconds. <clears throat> and I would claim that this is the first direct measurement of the instantaneous velocity of a Brownian particle. We, so we published this in 2010, and uh, it actually got a lot of press because uh, people were saying, well, this proved Einstein wrong. But it actually proved him right. He said the experiment's impossible, but he made a prediction. And what he predicted was that we would observe the uh, this equipartition theorem, which we did. I'll show you the data in a moment. And I've called this, uh, this thing Einstein's speed demon because it's Einstein's prediction. And it's a demon in the sense that it's collecting information. So our, our apparatus is, is watching this little particle move. And I call it speed because of doing it fast. So that's my name for this Einstein speed demon. And then we got this comment. Uh, you know, it's always nice to read anonymous comments, right, from referees and such. Uh, that's nice. But Einstein said it's impossible to observe the instantaneous velocity in a liquid. And Raisin's group only did it in air. All right, that, that's nice. I mean, it's true. So all right, so we said, uh, let's, let's look at this again. And, and uh, this is the slide that I showed before. Well, clearly, to go now to liquid, uh, it's, it really was a tall order. And so we had to develop some new tools, which we did, and also some new materials. And, and so we played with silica, which was what we used initially, which had this index of refraction. And then we went to barium titanate glass, which had a larger index of refraction, which helped us in, one, in, in our sensitivity. And also, we used a lower viscosity fluid, acetone, instead of water. We also used water. But by, by doing diff these different uh, combinations, we were able to resolve the instantaneous velocity of Brownian motion in liquids. And that was another paper in 2014. OK? So all right, so now. Now we have to ask, uh, what, what, what do we do from here? And, and this, by the way, this is our, uh, some, some characteristic data in water. And uh, it, it shows the, uh, the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution is the black curve. And, and that is just the, the prediction of the equipartition theorem. There are no adjustable parameters here. We, we use the mass of the bead. Actually, interestingly, for, for uh, liquid, we actually had to use not the bare mass of the bead, but an added mass, because it turns out that in a liquid, it actually drags along some of the liquid with it. And that's a long-standing prediction. Uh, in air, that, that you don't have this effect, because the, uh, the added mass is negligible. Now, something else that we did is we said, well, what if we, we, we had a chamber? We could cool it down. Uh, we could uh, evacuate it and, and, and uh, pull vacuum. And what if we, if we can measure the position of the bead, could we cool its center of mass motion? Now, I'm not talking about cooling the internal degrees of freedom. I'm just talking about the center of mass. And, and because the coupling between the center of mass and the internal degrees is so weak uh, that we could do this. In fact, this is the basis for a whole field that's been very active called uh, um, mechanical oscillators near the ground state or nanomechanical oscillators, different words. The whole community doing this in different systems. Uh, so what we did is we used our, our tweezer experiment, and we uh, added feedback cooling with pushing lasers. So if we sensed that the bead was moving in this direction, we, we used radiation pressure to, to give it a kick in the other direction. And we did this actually from three dimensions. And we, uh, sh this, is, this shows the data at different temp. So initially, uh, this was no feedback, no, no FB at this pressure. And as at lower temp, we, we had to go to lower vacuum because of time scale of our feedback loop. But uh, with full feedback, we went from nearly 300 Kelvin to 1.5 millikelvin in the center of mass motion. Now, this was still not the ground state of the oscillator. This was still, in terms of quanta, we were still around 1,000 quanta. So I'm not claiming. Uh, our purpose was not here to reach the ground state. Other, other groups have actually continued this work and, and even reached ground state uh, actual ground state cooling with this and with other systems. But the point is, is we can really get to low temperatures with this, uh, in, at least in the center of mass motion, with this feedback cooling. Uh, and we published this uh, in, in Nature Physics. So where, um, where do we go from here? And I want to spend a little time. I've left, actually, more time to outline uh, what we're going to do now. And I have to say that this experiment, um, 
I think the, the work that we did before uh, has, I think, settled the question of understanding equilibrium dynamic, equ equilibrium physics of, of this uh, Brownian motion. It verified Einstein's prediction. In a sense, there was no surprise, but, but you have to get the equilibrium physics right in, in order to go outside of equilibrium. And, uh, and I have to say, from my perspective, going out of equilibrium will be the most interesting thing of this work. But, uh, but if you can't get the equilibrium physics right, no one's going to believe when you say you're doing non-equilibrium, right? And so for me, this was extremely important. And we took a bit of a break from this, on this work because my last student on this project graduated. And then, um, and so it's been a few years, but now I've, I've recruited a new team of people, a postdoc and two students, and we have some funding. So I'm excited about these directions, and I'm going to sp spend a little time going through them. The first thing um, is to look at this picture again. This is, I don't know if I show this, but this is our data for a particle in air. And uh, our first goal was to say uh, we, we can verify the energy equipartition theorem. But now, let's say we believe that. We have good reason to believe it. Let's turn the problem around and say, uh, could we use this to determine the mass of the particle? Suppose we don't know the mass of the particle. Uh, all that matters here is the temperature and, and the velocity. And you know, 1 half mv squared equals 1 half kt. So if we measure, if we know the temperature and we measure the velocity, then we determine the mass. And we, f we figure that we could measure, uh, from our estimates of, of sensitivity, that we could measure at the picogram level. In fact, we think that with, combined with light scattering, we could actually be sensitive to a monolayer formation on, on, the, on the bead, on the surface of the bead. That would be enough that we could detect. And so, so then the question is, um, to study problems where the mass of the bead is not constant. Of course, with our glass bead in air, it was constant. And uh, the particular, the case I'm thinking about is um, the study of ice nucleation in saturated air. So here's a cloud. Right? And the way raindrops form is you have nucleation sites, dust particles in, in the atmosphere. These dust particles uh, are or find themselves in a, in a humidity and temperature where the conditions are right for nucleation. This is called heterogeneous nucleation because there's a nucleation site. And uh, now we have an analytical tool that can actually observe the onset of nucleation, the onset of ice formation on these particles. And if you can observe it, you have a chance of optimizing it. And, and this has been a longstanding dream. Could we seed clouds to make rain? I'm not saying we can yet. But now, for the first time, we have an analytical tool that could be used in principle to figure out the best way to, to, to optimize ice nucleation. And there's lots of things that we could vary. In fact, people have tried just dumping silver iodide into clouds. Maybe you've heard of that. And it doesn't really work. But, and, and you start investigating, well, why do they do that? And they didn't really have a great reason. They just said, well, the structure of silver iodide is similar to ice. And, but aside from that, they, they, they didn't have an analytical tool that could actually see uh, the onset of nucleation. So we could trap dust particles in our tweezer. I mean, right now we use beautiful spherical uh, microspheres, but we could trap silver iodide particles and actually observe, create the conditions for, for ice nucleation and see how well it works. There are some coatings that you can get. Uh, some of them are used actually for when, I, when we go to Snowbird, there's machines that make snow. <laughs> And they use a, a certain bacteria, maybe you know this, that, that, uh, that, that uh, uh, improves the, the, the nucleation and to, to, for making ice. And so we could, in principle, uh, study how that coating or the, uh, or, or the morphology or the mass of the particle could be optimized to, to make this process as efficient as we can. And maybe there's a chance that we could optimize cloud seeding. That would be interesting, right? Uh, I don't know yet, but, but up till now, we didn't have an analytical tool to actually see that, to see the onset of nucleation. So that makes it interesting. A second problem, and these are all things, out, I would say, out of equilibrium, but that's where I think the frontier really is. A second interesting problem, and, and, and I have to say that I'm venturing now into topics where I'm not an expert, so that's always a little dangerous, but also fun, so, uh, is to study turbulence in air. 
where we can generate uh, some turbulence by mixing a fan or anything and and now measure vorticity with our with our tweezer by looking simultaneously not just in one dimension but in two dimensions and seeing correlated motion will indicate vorticity and we there's a prediction called the Kolmogorov microscale uh, it, it is the smallest scale at which you have turbulence and below that, there's supposed to be a cutoff. And, and I think we have a chance of actually directly seeing that in our system, of our microsphere in, in, uh, in, in turbulent flow. So we could contribute to that field. Now, what happens? I mean, we, we went to short time scales. Uh, we went to short enough time scales that we could see this ballistic motion. But when I say short, it was still tens of nanoseconds. So why couldn't we go shorter? Well. There's two answers. One is uh, our detectors might be fast enough, but a, but a continuous laser wouldn't have enough photons for us to detect in, in, a, in, in say, 100 picoseconds. In order to do that, we would need a kilowatt laser, which would evaporate our bead. And so instead, we're going to use a pulsed laser, a pulsed picosecond laser. And uh, we have the laser. I was just in Finland a few weeks ago to, in Tampere, where my collaborator... Um, Mercia Guina has built a, a, a beautiful pulsed picosecond, 100 picosecond laser in the near infrared at 1.06 microns, and we are going to use that to probe um, the motion of this bead on, on the sub nanosecond time scale. And the way this works is that our time resolution will not be from a fast detector because we can't. We do, a, we don't have enough photons, and B, we don't, we don't have enough such fast detectors. But instead, by just an optical delay path. And anyone here who does fast, ultra-fast knows this, right, this routine method. We have a, a pulse laser, and, and this is not even ultra-fast. 100 picoseconds is, is hardly ultra-fast these days. But for us, it is. Uh, and we will pick off a, a so one beam shown here uh, will go straight through. The other beam will be delayed with a, uh, an optical delay path, so roughly one, one foot of delay is roughly one nanosecond of delay time. So by dialing that in, we can then pump and probe, or we can, in this case, it's two, two equal probes, and by separating them uh, according to their polarization, we can, um, we can then uh, use two detectors and then look at the, look at measure velocities on a time scale which is even sub nanosecond. Now we can also uh, not only do that, but we can uh, we can add a kicking laser, so that the same. And I'm not showing the, the the laser is picked off, and so another beam will come around and then use to kick the bead out of equilibrium, and now now we get it moving at some velocity, and now we can probe it and see how it relaxes back to equilibrium. And so there should be a decay of energy. And the question is, how does that energy decay? And, and what, is, what is interesting about this, I, I have to say that the, the, the theory has not yet been done. And uh, my, some theory friends who are experts in fluid dynamics believe that this will test the Navier-Stokes equation in a really fundamental way, because we will be able to see the onset of viscosity in time. Viscosity is put in by hand in the Navier-Stokes. Just like uh, you know, Ohm's law is an average law that is put in, and you know, in electrical circuits, but it's not a fundamental law. It, it's, it represents some average behavior. But if you could, if you could monitor the motion of a single electron, you would, you would not see Ohm's law. You would see some motion with scattering. Well, we can't look at an electron directly, at least not in this way. But we can observe this particle and see when does damping turn on. This damping indicates essentially the onset of the arrow of time. In a way, our, our system, um, it, when it's kicked, uh, there should be some time scale before it can couple to the, the degrees of freedom of the reservoir, the reservoir being the liquid or, or the, fl the fluid. And, and for time shorter than that, there's no way it can couple. And so there must be some non-exponential time. This is actually reminiscent of some things that were done that we did in my group 20 years ago with uh, the so-called quantum Zeno effect and an anti-Zeno effect and uh, with, with the atoms tunneling through a lattice. But here, the, the mechan I think the, the physics is quite different. But the phenomena could look very much the same, that if we have a particle and we kick it, initially it's not going to start decaying. And so we could, we could actually kick it and then reverse kick it. So we could keep moving it 
uh, in this way with no viscosity. So the particle might move in, a, in, a re in an ordinary room temperature fluid like water as if it's a superfluid. It sort of challenged our understanding of what does viscosity mean. And I think this is an interesting problem. And so we call this the classical Zeno effect. And I put a question mark there because the theory has not been done. And so we're not sure exactly what we're going to see. But, but this, is the, uh, this is the simple ex expectation. And the final thing that I want to talk about is, um, is sound detection. Uh, can, can we make a detector of sound at the limit of, qu of, of some quantum limit? Uh, and, and then turn that, make, make a sound uh, detection of sound, which is an ear, into a nose. <laughs> so how, how do we connect between an ear and our nose? I'll show you in a moment. But, uh, but can we make, in some sense, a quantum limited nose? Well, the way this works, this is, uh, this is a, an established field, and some of you already are probably bigger experts in the audience than I am. Uh, it's called the photoacoustic effect. Um, so uh, the idea there is that you, you take a laser beam that is tuned to a vibrational line of a molecule. You have some trace molecule in, a ga in air, say, and you want to detect it. So you have an infrared laser that's tuned to a vibrational line. That gets absorbed, and that couples through collisions with the background gas, which converts into translational motion of the, ga of the gas, of the air, which is measured as a sound, uh, as a sound wave. And that sound is picked up on a mic in a microphone. And the lasers are quantum, quantum cascade lasers, which are well known. And uh, Federico Capasso is one of the inventors. Uh, this is actually a commercial product. Uh, Gacera is one of the companies that sells this device. And, and what it's, what's amazing about this is it can reach a sensitivity of one part per trillion of trace gases. The question is, can you improve it? Well. We think maybe yes, and, and the, answer, the, 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 the way we would do this is that we would combine all our previous work. So what, what do we learn so far? We learned that a Brownian particle is, um, uh, has persistence. In other words, it doesn't, it doesn't immediately change its direction. It will move in a straight line. We can detect that line, so that, that, that motion, with our speed demon, so we can, we can know how it's moving. Then we can apply feedback. Now, we, in, our, in our previous work, we applied feedback in vacuum because we weren't, to, we weren't too concerned about being fast. But we can apply fast modulation methods to do this on a time scale short compared to the momentum relaxation. Also, we can make the case easier by going to a somewhat larger bead. So we can get to hundreds of microseconds in air and apply fast feedback cooling. So the idea behind this acoustic detector is that we would apply feedback during which the, the detector would be uh, brought down close to the, the, qu the quantum ground state, or think about it as zero, a zero Kelvin, close to zero Kelvin. And then we would listen. Now, the listening time is limited by the return to equilibrium, so we can't listen for too long. And if we want to be listening all the time, we would have to have one, one being actively, act actively cooled while the other listening, and then, and then reverse the, the order. So what could you do with, with an ultimate acoustic detector? First of all, uh, this is a title of my proposal to the FQXI, which is the Foundational Questions Institute. They actually had a call for proposals on something called information as fuel to do something. <laughs> fuel being, uh, in, in this case, uh, the information as fuel would be something like a Maxwell demon. And so I, write, I wrote a pre-proposal which was then selected as a, we're now finalists. We'll find out if we get this funded. We'll do it in any case, but this will allow us to do it faster. And I see two interesting applications of an ultra-sensitive acoustic detection. One of them is that there is a, uh, a very large effort, obviously, in, in detection of dark matter. And, and also cosmogenic neutrinos. And the, one of the devices, the machines that are used, is called a bubble chamber. And so as these particles pass through a bubble chamber, they leave a track. And typically, they detect light from that. But increasingly, there, there's interest in, in acoustic signatures. Right now, they're only using uh, uh, the acoustics to uh, veto uh, uh, loud sounds that, they, that are background, like uh, alpha particles. That are that create uh, sound sources that they have to they have to veto out, but 
uh, there's, been, there's conferences that discuss this, and I've been talking with some high energy uh, physicists in my department and outside, uh, because there's a potential for improving these detectors if you could have an ultra-sensitive acoustic detector, because then you could, you could have very fast detection and very faint uh, acoustic signatures. And so I don't know yet how, you know, the numbers are still not clear, but I think this is an interesting discussion to have. Can we impact these dark matter searches with this new kind of microphone? The second one, way on a different spectrum, but related to my interests in medicine, is can we detect disease, uh, all kinds of disease, but let's just say cancer, by smelling? Now that sounds a bit crazy, but uh, there's anecdotal evidence that dogs can smell disease, even cancer. Of course, we can't prove it. Uh, and in fact, uh, here's a challenge. This is a this is a very simple challenge. And amazingly, in you know 2019, we have not met this challenge. Can we surpass a dog's nose? This is our, one of our dogs, Cosette, and she has a great nose, a great personality, also, as as you can tell. But uh, they have an incredible sense of smell. But we don't have an we don't have a artificial electronic nose that can do better than Cosette right now, uh, so that's a challenge. Um, so I'll I'll end with that and just to just to say that there's other things that we're doing. Um, I, I, we're continuing our work on alternatives to laser cooling and evaporative cooling of atoms, and I've spoken about this before, which is essentially an autonomous Maxwell's demon. And my talk yesterday was on these three topics, efficient isotope separation for medicine, the Pointsman Foundation, which I founded, and the Pointsman Laboratory. But you can read about these in Physics Today from 2016, 2018. So I'm going to end here and acknowledge my current members of my group and thank you for your attention. I guess, um, I, and that's a question for Dave also, but I, I thought the scale, the healing length would be too short for us with, with these, uh, but maybe not, with these uh, to see directly image uh, or to see vorticity with our, par our particles are typically a micron or larger. Um, it's probably too big, I would think. But, but I am interested. I think I think someone might might be interesting to study superfluid helium. Um, maybe we could see other things. I, I think, especially, uh, we don't have the funding to do that. So, but it but it could be an interesting system to study. Certainly, yeah. It's a it's a different kind of fluid. It's a quantum fluid. Absolutely. And 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 you'd have to do it in in in, in helium. You couldn't do this with alkali gases because they would they would simply stick to our our little bead. So it would have to be something like like a superfluid helium. Yes. How to reduce which effect? The the. Yeah, well, I think for our, for our purposes, we don't we don't need to reach the anywhere near the quantum limit. I, I will, I, in other words, I'm looking at how how much we can improve a, a microphone compared to a room temperature microphone. So if we can get even below one Kelvin, I think that'll already be a substantial improvement. Uh, the, I think the surprising thing here is that no one, to my knowledge, talks about feedback cooling in, in the presence of an environment. People, when they talk about cooling mechanical oscillators, they really want to get rid of the environment completely. They go to vacuum. And here it's almost perverse. I said, no, I, I want the water and I want the air. <laughs> but, but the point is, is that those, those environments don't act instantaneously. They, they actually allow us to do measurements where it could be very quiet for some time. It's just a question of time scales, really. So that, to me, is, is a richer, in a way, for us, it's a richer system to have it coupled to the environment 
and use it as a like for acoustics. It's just a different perspective. Other question? Yeah, yeah, so ultimately, you're right. I mean, ultimately, we will, we have to know that the temperature is not fluctuating. So I, I, we can't, we, we're, we're going to be limited by that. I agree. We'll have to see how much that's limiting us. But, um, um, so yes, the, the, there are, there are uh, methods that, of thermometry. Uh, for example, I, I know Misha Lukin has done uh, NV centers in Diamond where they can, they can do very, precise thermometry on, on a very small scale. So you could imagine a local probe that would, uh, th there could be more sophisticated methods of thermometry. So we'll have to think about that for sure. Yeah, thank you for the question. You're talking about like uh, photoacoustics of solids? Yeah, for example. Uh, actually, uh, uh, Alexei just gave me a paper just before, just before the talk about that, and I have to think about it. <clears throat> so I don't know right now enough about that. Possibly. There might be, there might be for acoustic imaging, like ultrasonic imaging. There might be, I don't know. I mean, you know, I'm open to ideas. Right now, right now our goal is just to demonstrate the, the basic effect and show that we can have this sensitivity. And then I'm hoping that then the community will tell us, oh, you know, this is here's now an interesting thing to measure. And also you didn't cover it, but I, I still could not resist thinking if you really would trap your beat and go to almost ground state motion, then any scattered photostate, which you have seen with photons, would be after scattering entangles with this beam motion. That would be another reincarnation of this optomechanics, but not with and and there are groups that are working on that, like Marcus Aspelmeyer and and I think Lucas Novotny and and others, uh, uh, Peter Barker. So there there are actually quite a few groups now who are interested in this sort of thing of of making entangled states and making uh, Schrodinger cat states of and and I, I would say we're we're really not so much in that. Area because we're, we're we we like to be coupled to the environment. Give us environment, you know. We want water and we want air. That's that's almost that's like anathema to quantum physicists usually. So I have to overcome that bias on my part, no, right? Because uh, but people who want to study uh, these kind of entanglement problems, you probably would not want this effect. <laughs> 